All right, module number three, covering two chapters from the pen test book. As always, there's a do I know this for every chapter. So if you haven't knocked that out already, please do so. It is good to knock that out. It's only about five minutes. And it'll help you know whether this chapter or the next chapter uh, need more of your time, just enough time, or you're good enough that you could skip it. Reconnaissance is always the first step in a cyber attack. Most of the time, you may not know what's happening. Now I say most, because as you'll see in a, just a bit, the, there will be some signs as the recon gets closer to you. Uh, but there is a reconnaissance that typically starts without you knowing or ever knowing that it is happening. For a, a pen test, we need to gather initial information about our target before we figure out the different ways that we can continue to scan and gather additional information. After getting our paperwork in order and making sure that if things go south, we won't get in trouble, this is the next step. And, you'll, and you should spend a great portion of your time in this step because the more information you have on your target, the more successful your attack will actually be. If you skip this step or don't do enough recon before you actually do the attack, things may go south and cause more problems than, than successes. So DNS recon is one tool that you can use. It's available in Kali that you can uh, get yourself because it's a Python script uh, that will, can help you to move forward in things like running nmap scans to find what services are running on the target, whether that's a network or a device. Your common active reconnaissance, uh, which is sending probes like packets out, can be various forms. Like I said, it could be host-based, it could be network, it could be users, it could be groups, it could be a network share, a web page, the application that's facing out the world, a service, or even a crafting packets using tools like Scapy. Uh, external enumeration is normally one of the first things you do in a pen test. You want to find what internet facing hosts exist on a target network, as those will be their first targets to get in. These devices should be behind a firewall or should be behind a firewall and a DMZ or should be behind a firewall in an air gapped network. We don't know. We're starting from the beginning. So we wanna find what is exposed out. From the other point of view, we wanna ensure that we have the minimal amount of ports open, the minimal amount of exposure to the outside world. A simple sport, port scan will tell us what services are running on any of those exposed ports. Nmap is your friend in this. It is one of the most commonly used tools and should be one that you should be very familiar with. A TCP SYN scan, S-Y-N, which is the, the dash S, little s, big S, or a TCP connect scan, which is the little s, big T, we'll, we'll see if a port is open. And you'll get one of three results. You'll either get open, closed, or filtered. So if you get open, that means we got from the target a TCP SYN acknowledgement. If we got a reset, 
that means it's closed. If we get filtered, the port is firewalled. Nmap will tell you what port is open. So no, it doesn't, uh, it will, it can, but one, one thing at a time. So like I said, our attack system will launch a probe to say port 80 and will tell us that by the response back, whether that port is open or closed. This is a TCP connect scan, as you can see by the lower, lower S and capital T. A UDP scan has similar results. For example, if a port returns open or open filtered, you have one of two options. It's either the service is listening or it's firewalled or timed out. Because it's UDP, it's connectionless. So we may, may not know for sure. If we do get closed, on the other hand, we can say that for sure the port itself is closed. There's Nmap uh, with the SU for UDP. If a scan is detected, and mind you, Though Nmap is a very common tool, it is a very noisy tool. Actually, not as noisy as Nessus and others, but it is noisy itself that it is detectable by an IDS or an IPS. So let's say a firewall detected a scan happening and blocked you. Well, another way that you could use is the thin scan or the little s big F to determine if a port is open or closed. If you get a filtered response, then that means the, uh, the port should be closed. If, it's clo if you get a reset, then you know it's closed. If you get no response, then it should be open. There's your fin scan. One of the most common scans is a ping scan with a dash SN. If a entire subnet is being scanned with ping, that is called a ping sweep. So like I said, we do have different ways of exploring uh, what is on the other side since we're starting from externally. Uh, one way would be the host. Uh, we can find a host internally or externally. If we're doing this externally, we want to limit the number of IP addresses we're scanning to reduce the chance of inadvertently scanning any IP addresses that are outside the scope. If we're scanning internally, then we can just do the full subnet used by the target. We could scan by the user, as shown here, where we use, especially in a Windows network, we can use the message service block to see what users exist. So we get with SMB com negotiate we get things like what protocols, what flags and options are used by the server. And then we can use the comm session setup to, for authentication to find usernames, passwords, and domains. Nmap has a, um, an NSC called SMB NM users that you can use to find the users that exist in a, in a domain. So there's Nmap. 
running that script that I just mentioned uh, with our username and password that we figured out from something else. And then it tells us the users that exist. And maps NSC script can also do groups. So you can do SMB NM groups and get what groups exist. There's also one for shares, which can also lead us into the network. There is one for web pages. We can, uh, by doing this, we can see what what kind of server is running. We can see the uh, the web pages and, and uh, any information that's embedded within them. You could also use another tool called Nico, Nito. It's not as robust as a vulnerability, a web vulnerability scanner, but it does help you quickly enumerate a web server. Again, this tool is, is noisy. So if you run it, know that a, an IDS, an IPS, or a well-trained uh, a well-trained analyst will detect the, uh, the signature of this tool being used. So be careful when you use it but it is useful. Going back to Nmap, you can also use the Nm processes to see uh, the services that are running on a Windows system. Now, like I said, Nmap doing this kind of stuff is noisy. So if you want it to be more uh, stealthy and you want it to not trigger any alarms, you could use a tool like Scapey to craft a packet to get through the IDS undetected and see what's available. So those are the active ways to get uh, some information. These are ways that are detectable by tools that are detectable by analysts. One way that you cannot detect is anything passive. So like I said, starting a pen test, we wanna find any domains that are in the scope of our target. We don't wanna just scan the whole internet at large. We wanna focus on our target. We could search for any subdomains using things like Google. We could use an awesome tool called DNS Dumpster to reveal information about a domain. We could also do things like dig as shown here and NS lookup to do zone transfers. A lot of this stuff is completely undetectable. How do you detect someone Googling you? Not really possible now, is it? These are all those first steps that happen before an actual attack occurs. Uh, and this all falls really under the open source intelligence, gathering any of the information that's publicly available on the internet. The larger your target's presence is online, the more information will be available. So two tools that you can use in this is Recon NG, which you have you will have a lab to do this week and Shodan, which you have been reading and, and practicing with already. Vulnerability scanners are pretty awesome. They'll tell us whether a service is vulnerable. They'll match our software with any already known vulnerabilities. The main problem of vulnerability scanners is false positives. A typical vulnerability scanner, such as Nessus, 
we'll go through a basic four-step process. Uh, so like I said, we'll, we would do NMAP to perform the host and port enumeration. Then the scanner probes those open ports for more information. When it has enough info about the open port determining and determine what software and version are running, it'll record that information for further analysis. It'll get things like any banners as well. It'll determine that uh, if that software that's listening is susceptible to any known vulnerabilities by looking at uh, CVEs and, and other databases and then give you that report. Your different types of scans can be the unauthenticated. So we're not using any credentials. We're just seeing what's exposed. The authenticated, the, having a username and password in order to get the full picture. We have the discovery, which again is uh, typically what we use NMAP for. We have the full, enabling every scanning option in the scan policy, which uh, you can do within Nessus. And stealth, which would be passive seeing what information we can gather uh, on the network. So we're analyzing packets, we're analyzing the data that's flowing on our network and pulling together that information to create our vulnerability report. And of course we have compliance. You know, meeting major laws like HIPAA by using uh, Nessus specifically tailored for things like that. The challenges that you face when running a vulnerability scan, number one is the best time because these scans create a lot of noise and could create a lot of congestion on the network. So that means we might, might inadvertently crash a target or a network infrastructure device. You gotta pick the right time to do this kind of stuff. Also, what protocols are you using? So if, um, if the target is using TCP and UDP, then include both. If uh, uh, the network topology, it's not recommended really to scan over uh, WAN because it'll impact any devices along the path. You want to be as close to the target as possible to do a scan. And if we're coming from the outside, you know that firewalls and other devices might get in the way of your scan. Again, these types of things are really noisy. So you want to limit your bandwidth when running these types of scans, if, especially if you're doing it during the day. Uh, so make sure that you throttle your, your queries if, if you're running during the day and you could cause a crash. You also have devices that are fragile or that are non-traditional, things like printers, IoT, and anything that may not be able to handle vulnerability scanning. These will require a modified scan so you don't overwhelm them crash them, and if you are unfamiliar with how they work, well, even more reason to be careful when scanning those types of devices. Running the scan, as you saw in Nessus, is pretty much a piece of cake once the tool is up and running. It's interpreting the results, removing false positives that will be the hardest part. So this involves looking at the results that your tool provided and verifying that everything is truth. The good thing is you don't have to do this alone. There's a lot of places that you can look for further investigation like the US CERT, uh, the CERT division of Carnegie Mellon University, NIST, JP CERT, uh, the CAPEC, CVEs, and CWE. As a pen tester, your goal is to identify the weaknesses that can be exploited. And the ultimate way to verify 
a vulnerability is to exploit it. So as a general rule, if a vulnerability has a matching module in, for example, Metasploit, it should probably be considered high as a high severity. Uh, addressing, addressing some of these questions can help you prioritize what vulnerabilities you found. For example, what is the severity? How many systems does this vulnerability apply to? How was it detected? Uh, was the vulnerability found with an automated scanner or manually? Uh, what's the value of the device on which the vulnerability was found? Is the device critical to business or infrastructure? What's the attack vector? How does it apply to the environment? And is there a workaround or mitigation available? Now I see some stuff in the chat. What do we have here? Does NIDS detect span ports? Uh, security, and you know, I haven't used security onion. Actually, I had bad experience with it and I didn't use it again. Um, yes, there is a, a thing for that, but if you wanted to hide uh, for a span port, just use a network tap. Then you can't detect it. I believe you're referring to that earlier picture. Where'd it go, this one? Yeah, the span port on the switch there. Like, is there a way to detect that there's a new computer plugged into the network that's asking to be a span port? Yeah, so a uh, way around this would simply be to use a network tap. Cool. One chapter down, one to go. Uh, just like all the other chapters, make sure you do the, do I know this? Social engineering attacks. Uh, let me start by saying humans are your weakest link. You could have the best infrastructure in place, the best tools, the best sniffers, the best nids, hids, everything, the whole nine yards. All it takes is one human to click on the wrong link, one person to do the one thing they shouldn't do and everything collapses because your physical security and your digital security are one. So just like uh, you tell all your fellow coworkers, make sure all the doors and windows are closed at the end, make sure you turn on the alarm. If the alarm wasn't set and that person leaves, something could happen. And well, that would be catastrophic because the alarm wasn't on and, and that's the night that you got robbed. All it takes is one person to do the one thing they shouldn't and everything collapses. So now that we got that out of the way, <laughs> um, social engineering comes in many forms and being familiar with the terms and, and uh, what they connect to is good because that shows up in the test. For example, we have our traditional phishing, an attacker presenting a, a, a link to a user or an attachment that looks like something valid, something trusted, but of course, as soon as they click on it, uh, it'll either get information out, like use any password, it'll infect them. Uh, you know, anything could happen just because they clicked on the link thinking it was a legitimate link. And of course it wasn't. Right, pdf.exe, you know, sometimes it works. For example, a Windows, the default setting in Windows is to remove the extension. 
So somebody who's not paying attention will look at SD8585 PDF and think, oh, it's a PDF. So even though to our eyes, the EXE stands out, in a default Windows install, it that .exe won't be there. The next is farming and farming with a PH. A threat actor is redirecting victims from a valid website or a resource to a malicious one that looks like a valid one to the user. Kind of men in the middle -y, where instead of the user going to the right place, like Amazon, they, they go to Amazon, but Amazon has a zero instead of an O. And they log in and you do whatever. And as they do that, we take either we install malware or uh, we take information from them. Farming can be done by doing things like altering the host file of the victim system. Uh, it could also be done by DNS poisoning or exploiting a vulnerability in a DNS server so that it really looks like they're going to amazon.com, but unless you were running Wireshark, you'll, well, you'll miss the, uh, the redirect to a malicious site. There's, there is malvertising, similar to farming, but it's involving malicious ads on trusted websites. This results in the user's browser being inadvertently redirected to sites hosting malware. This is why having things like uh, the Raspberry Pi come in place with, um, with PyHole installed. Uh, if you do that on an HTTPS site, it will say invalid cert. It might not because you can get valid certs off of Let's Encrypt. The website could be malicious. I could make a malicious website and make a uh, Let's Encrypt cert for it. And that will, buy, that will bypass the, the whole invalid cert. This is why you gotta be weary of ads because it is possible to run a malicious ad inside of a legitimate website. There is spear phishing, a phishing attempt constructed at a very, in a very specific way and directly targeted to specific individuals or companies. So this kind of attack takes some studying of the victim. The attacker has to understand the victim, the organization in order to be able to make these emails look legitimate. Spear phishing, if you see a spear phishing attack, you know that an attacker is watching and has been watching for a while. You see these kinds of things. This is definitely a red alert. We need to scan everything. We need to see what is happening because how are they in and how are they getting this information? We have SMS phishing, which is using text messages. There is voice phishing or vishing you, through a phone conversation. Persuade, the attacker persuades the user to reveal private information or financial information or you know, just general information that, that the attacker, excuse me, that the attacker needs. Attackers can spoof or impersonate the, uh, the caller ID to hide who they really are during this. There is also whaling, similar to phishing and spear phishing. Whaling is an attack targeted at high profile business executives or key individuals in a corporation. So these attacks are designed to look like a critical business email 
or something from someone who has legitimate authority, whether they're externally, like say a government agency with three letters, or internally, like say anybody who, um, who their position can be an acronym of three letters. More ways of social engineering, elicitation, interrogation, and impersonization. That's a funny word. Anyway, elicitation, the act of gaining knowledge or information from people. Um, interrogators can ask good open-ended questions to learn about individuals' viewpoints, values, goals. This information can be used to continue gathering additional information from another victim. Asking closed-ended questions can get more control out of the conversation or to stop it. If you ask too many questions, the victim can shut down. The interaction asking a few questions may seem a little awkward. Social engineering has a certain finesse. This can also uh, take things like the victim's posture or body language, the color of a victim's skin, the direction of the victim's head and eyes, movement, victim's hands and feet, uh, mouth and lip expressions, pitch and rate of victim's voice, their words, the length syllables, dysfunctions and pauses. Pretexting is when an attacker presents as someone else in order to gain access to information. This can be simple and quick, like pretending to be someone in the organization or complex in creating a whole new identity and then manipulating the recipient of information. This all falls under social engineering. So some of the motivation techniques the first and foremost is authority. A social engineer shows confidence and perhaps authority, whether that's legal authority, organizational, or social. There is the scarcity and urgency. Scarcity being cause, causing a fear, a feeling of urgency in a decision-making context. So specific language can be used to heighten urgency and manipulate the victim. Um, case in point, uh, salespeople are really good at this or like um, um, real estate buying a house and they're like, well, you know, these other people are, are thinking of closing. So uh, you better hurry. Or things like the sale is only for today or there's limited supply. That's the scarcity and urgency social engineering tactic. There is social proof, a psychological phenomenon in which an individual is not able to determine the appropriate mode of behavior. So this is used when an individual enters an unfamiliar situation that he or she doesn't know how to deal with, enabling this person and all others to be manipulated. For example, getting a non-technical person to do something technical, getting that person out of their element to where they feel like they have to follow directions in order to get whatever it is done. There's the likeness, using human vulnerabilities, such as aesthetically pleasing, being appreciated and talked about. That can work to lower someone's defenses. And of course, there's fear, manipulating a person with fear to act promptly, since fear is an unpleasant emotion based on the belief that something bad or dangerous may take place. Fear is used by social engineers to get their victim to act quickly to avoid or rectify dangerous or painful situation, kind of like the, uh, the, uh, the IRS is calling you and if you hang up right now, a arrest warrant is gonna go out for you. So better do what they say because otherwise you're going straight to jail. I got two more. The good old soul, uh, shoulder surfing. If you don't have a, uh, a privacy screen on your laptop when you're out and about, 
well, I mean, you know, when we return back to normal and uh, we can be out and about again, you don't have a privacy screen on and you're logging on to uh, like your work or uh, to anything of, of importance, know that anybody can see what you're doing. This can get a little more crazy uh, depending on who the, the attacker is because they could be using things like binoculars, telescopes, small hidden cameras and microphones. Uh, this attack is definitely prevalent in crowded places. Not a problem right now because we're all still locked in, but you know, when we get back to normal, shoulder surfing will be a threat again. And the other is USB key drops. Simply leaving a USB stick unattended or placing them in strategic locations can be enough to get a user to think, oh, this device is lost and insert it into their system to figure out who, it's, uh, who it belongs to and return it to them. Easy way of infecting a system. Another way that you can see that something is happening around is a USB stick being attached to a wall. If you've never seen one of those, it's a pretty interesting tactic of sharing information out in the public and just having the USB just chilling just like that. Any questions on all of this? I know it's kind of a lot of info, but it's definitely interesting stuff. If you lose, if you use LastPass to autofill everything and don't actually type, is that less vulnerable? I would be a little weary about the autofill. I have Bitwarden, but I do not let it autofill. Because in case I go, I accidentally go to a malicious site, I don't want my, my um, password manager to give away my credentials. What I'm talking about is like the password manager icon that shows up on the right side of the password field and you can click on it and click if you want to fill it in or not. Is that more secure than actually typing in the password from the point of view of someone 